All right, John Galt. So at the beginnings of the Radio Astrophysical Observatory, here's John and his daughter, Sheila, as the observatory building is being built. John <clears throat> grew up in the Ontario area and was born in Toronto, downtown. Here he is, a radio ham. There he is studying under his sister's portrait of Isaac Newton in high school. He joined the Navy, and uh, lucky, luckily enough, he wasn't sent uh, abroad. The war ended, but he was trained as a radio artificer. Uh, so John Galt is a radio guy, okay? <clears throat> 1945 to 1949, University of Toronto, he majored in physics. Summer 1948, he was the night assistant at the David Dunlop Observatory. So not only did he study physics, he was also into astronomy. Necessarily yeah. <laughs> so he finishes his undergraduate, and where does he go? He joins the Dominion Observatory, but not as an astronomer. He joins the Magnetic Division, and he's sent to Cornwallis Island. And he spends, he winters over. Uh, John actually hated guns, but of course up there you need one, right? Uh, you need one for obvious reasons. He kept a photo album of his year there. This is what he started like, or this is what it was like when he started in 1949 in August. He kept some pretty interesting co uh, company. This was George the Cook. He's reading Love is a Deadly Weapon. Um, <laughs> This is the hard way to get a wire from the antenna over to here. Uh, John, you can see his humor coming through here. Uh, here's a picture of a cairn, and this was one of the two dogs in the observatory that was Muckluck. This is a shot that was in his album. No, no caption, but it's pretty darn amazing. Uh, so he also builds the equipment there from scratch, electronics expertise. He's trying to ma make devices to measure the magnetic field. Come on in, grab a seat anywhere. Um, so here's a picture of John with some of the devices that he's put together. He's measuring the Earth's magnetic field up there. Uh, so we also know not only can he build instruments, he's measuring magnetic fields. All right, These are some things we know about John Galt. He then comes back from his year away and joins the University of Toronto. Uh, he, he starts working under, I believe it was Harry Welch, Henry Welch? Harry, Harry yes. Uh, and so he starts his PhD. This is his thesis. It took six years to complete. And he measures high pressure, 1,500 atmosphere, mercury vapor. Uh, and he's measuring spectra in, uh, at University of Toronto. But during that time, he still continues his, astron his interest in astronomy. He does a summer at the uh, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory working under Ed Argyle, building a photometer for the Plaskett Telescope. He also does a solar ecl eclipse expedition in uh, Ontario, but clouded out. This is his apparatus. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, exploded in, while he was doing his uh, experiment, trying to get up to 1,500 uh, atmospheres. So he never, able was, never was able to achieve that high pressure but uh, it was actually a very dangerous, dangerous experiment to run. So John Galt is a spectroscopist. This is what John was doing at University of Toronto. Now, another student of Welsh's was Jack Locke. In 1956, Locke was working at the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, and he started a six-part colloquium series uh, at Dominion on radio astronomy. He invited six prominent speakers. C.S. Beals, the Dominion astronomer, was at the AAS meeting in Columbus, Ohio in March, and he saw John Bolton give a talk. So he thought this talk was so great, he invited him up to give one of these colloquia on radio astronomy, and this really had an effect on the people in Ottawa, what he told them. He was at Caltech at the time. Now we have to step back a little bit. Uh, this is something that Woody had to skip over. I'll cover it very briefly, the 21 centimeter line. 1945, Hank Vandehuls in Leiden, uh, he predicts atomic hydrogen in space should emit radio waves at about 21 centimeters in wavelength, 1420.4058 megahertz on the radio dial. A lot of history in here in that book goes into the six years looking for that line. 
March 25th, 1951, Harold Doc Ewan and Edward Purcell, who later won the Nobel Prize for NMR, uh, they measure the 21 centimeter line using this horn antenna sticking out of the window of Lyman Hall at Harvard University. Now, of course, Doc tells this story about this cover. That cover was there because the pesky undergraduates used to like to throw snowballs into the antenna, and it would end up back in the laboratory here. Now, <clears throat> yeah, it could have been, could have been. But uh, Doc wanted to be done with this. It was a very long and hard observation. He didn't get very far after uh, many years. He went to Ed, and he tells Dr. Purcell, I'd really like to move on. Could I finish? And Dr. Purcell tells his student, if you write a paper about, or a thesis about something you didn't detect, it has to be twice as long and twice as good. So Doc went back to the lab and measured the 21 centimeter line. There's Doc with the, uh, and with the horn as it exists today on the lawn in Greenbank, West Virginia. There it is again. Now here's the horn, there's Doc, there's Purcell. Where are they? They're in Harvard, Massachusetts. At Harvard, Massachusetts, uh, which is not where Harvard is, it's a, it's a city out west in Harvard, uh, in Massachusetts, they built a 60-foot dish. And on that occasion, they brought out the two guys who discovered the 21-centimeter line and their horn for the opening dedication. And they even had a, the, the company that built it, D.S. Kennedy, outside of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, even took out a full page ad in, I think it was Science Magazine. I don't know who was in the, in, in the running for getting a 60 foot telescope in their backyard, but they make a strong go of it here. So these guys are uh, at the dedication. Well, turns out that someone else was at that dedication. That was C.S. Beals, the Dominion astronomer. So the next day, two days later, he writes a letter. Uh, at that time, the Dominion Observatory was under the Department of Mines and Technical Surveys, uh, not the National Research Council. That didn't happen until 1970, the merge. So Beals writes a letter to the minister, and he says a number of things, including, hey, we just had six really good talks on radio astronomy in Ottawa. People here are talking about it all the time. But I was just down in Harvard, Massachusetts, where they built this 60-foot radio telescope. And then I went to the AAS. And let me tell you something. If we don't get involved with radio astronomy now, it's going to cost us a lot of money later to catch up when the rest of the world becomes good at this. And moreover, our buddies at the NRC know what they're doing when it comes to building radio antennas. And they're going to get involved in it. And we're going to get left in the dust. So let's get a telescope, and let's make this happen. So meanwhile, while this is going on, where's John Galt? What's he up to? Well, after he finished his PhD, he worked in industry. He went to work for DuPont in Kingston, Ontario. He worked there for a year, and he really missed research. And he especially didn't like that company. Uh, he applied to Leiden, Cambridge, and Jodrell Bank for a postdoctoral fellowship. He got back a letter immediately from Bernard Lovell, and he says, yes, you can come to Jodrell, but we don't have money to pay you. Well, that didn't really help. <laughs> so uh, Jack Locke, who had the same PhD advisor, suggested that John apply for this position that they were holding at Dominion Observatory for a radio astronomer. They flew him to Ontario, or maybe he just drove up to Ottawa, rather. And uh, he was interviewed by Beals and Locke, and he immediately was offered the job. Uh, he was offered the job, but there was no observatory for him to go and work at. So he took up that offer from Jodrell Bank. They said, well, Dominion will pay me. Can I come out still? Sure enough. And so that's where he went. And the plan was he'll come back to Canada and be the first, the director of the first radio astronomy observatory in Canada. So also around this time, same John Bolton puts out a paper with Paul Wilde, who we saw earlier. And so they, on a drive back from Owens Valley to Pasadena at Caltech, they talk in the car about the possibility of measuring Zeeman splitting, or the Zeeman effect, in the 21 centimeter line. Wilde had just written a paper all about the atomic properties of hydrogen. He said, you know something? I think you could measure magnetic fields in space using this. 
And so how does that work exactly? So here's Peter Zeman back in 1896. He measured this effect. He didn't know what he was seeing. He worked with this guy named uh, Lorentz. They shared the 1902 Nobel Prize for the discovery they made. What was it? If you have an absorption profile, for instance, in the 21 centimeter line, and there's a magnetic field out in the hydrogen atoms in space pointing towards or away from you, the absorption profile will be split or broadened. And one part of the line will have its light coming to you like this clockwise, and the other will go counter. Well, reversed for you, another problem in polarization. Um, when you do that, you look at the difference between right and left circular polarization, and you'll see a little S on its side. If you make that measurement, you have found the fingerprint of magnetic fields out in space. So <clears throat> who is John Galt in 1957? Well, we just saw he's a radio guy. He's an astronomer. He builds equipment. He measures magnetic fields. He measures spectra. He does everything you could possibly do in order to be the right guy to be the first person to ever follow up Bolton's suggestion and look for Zeeman splitting. So that's exactly what he did, because when he arrived at Jodrell Bank, there was just a bunch of steel workers building a 250-foot telescope back there. There was no working telescope. So they went to John, and they said, well, welcome. You want to learn about radio astronomy. I want you to build the first 21-centimeter receiver that we can use on this big telescope. This is a picture Jack Locke took when he visited Jodrell Bank in 1958, so the same time John was there. How do you put a receiver up at the focus? That's a very interesting question. There's only one feed leg. So <clears throat> back then, we'll get to that. But here is the receiver that John built with the help from Trevor Tunley in the machine shop. Very complicated heating mechanism, light bulb, and a fan to cool it down, keep everything at the right temperature. Uh, this is what it looked like when the cap was on right there. So how did you get it up there? Back in the day, you turned the telescope upside down, and you hoisted the receiver up to the top of that turret. A lot better than climbing up there. So here's Commander Tolson and the heavies, and there they are getting the receiver ready to go up. And then they hoist it up there and install it upside down on the telescope. They don't do that anymore. Um, and then here, some poor fella has to climb up and just double check everything's working. Well, that poor fella we discovered, <clears throat> if you look a little closer, is a fella named Conrad Slater. Conrad was a graduate student working with John. And I've cleared this up with Rod Davies. He was John's student. He was working, he had an advisor at Manchester, but he spent all day, every day with John, uh, climbing up doing all the, the nuts and bolts. And he really, I could not find any information about Conrad. Uh, he left astronomy as soon as he was done in 1961. But Google helps. If you Google Conrad Slater, I found that he had just finished the 10K. So I got in contact with the Kendall Running Club. And they got me his telephone number. And we, we talked for a couple of hours all about his early days. I said, did you happen to know a man named John Galt? And he said, ah. Who, what, how? And so we talked for a couple of hours all about his early days. He told me some fantastic stories about his work with John. He really loved working with John. Uh, he told me one thing in particular that a couple of people have told me that stood out at that time. He would try to teach his daughter, Sheila, <clears throat> the term, the obliquity of the ecliptic. <laughs> but it only ever came out bicti kiptic. And you know, he. <clears throat> I, I, this is a guy who was pretty serious. You know, he really wanted to get her to understand. Well, she did get the science. She is now a professor of nanoscience at the Chalmers Institute of Technology. She really got, she got what he was trying to preach there. So um, some other things. So uh, who was working in the early days? That's Dave Heeshan. He was the director of the National Radio Astronomical Observatory. So he got to know John pretty well. Um, Conrad told me about these lab coats, these dark lab coats. Uh, John went out and bought his team, which consisted of John, Conrad Slater, and someone who we all knew at some point, probably a lot of you, I didn't, but Bill Shooter was a graduate student of John Galt's at uh, Jodrell Bank working on this project. He bought them all these blue lab coats so that they could stick out as a team as they walked around Jodrell Bank. And he also made his two students work in shifts so that 
at any given time, one student would be there a few hours earlier than everyone else in the morning to turn the lights on in the noise hut. And someone would stay later to turn the lights off. So it always looked like they were working harder than everyone else. <laughs> um, so here's the noise hut. Here's his receiver. There's one thing I found interesting in an interview. He says, well, I didn't ride a bicycle in Toronto. My parents thought it was really too dangerous. And it probably was. Uh, the first bicycle I ever rode was when I was in England, when he's almost 30 years old. And you look at that picture, and one thing you might notice is everywhere in those photos in Jodhra Bank, there's his bicycle. There, well, imagine having to learn how to ride as a postdoctoral fellow. So, um, well, why is it that? It's not just a tangential point. John came back here, and after his kids had grown up, he had all these remnant bicycles hanging around the yard that no one was using. So he got really famous in Penticton for building what he called goof bicycles. He would build bikes that had casters for uh, front wheels. He had bikes that you had to pedal backwards to move forwards. He had pedals that had two different gears on either side. And then there was the most infamous one, the one that you had to turn left in order to move right. And so his son David was the only person that could successfully ride that bicycle. John tried in his later years and failed. So uh, that was his own ingenuity back to bite him. So back to the science. These guys make an effort. They write up the paper. They did not detect Zeeman splitting. John had moved to Penticton. He was recalled back because the observatory was getting ready to go. Uh, but they couldn't make that measurement. Well, turns out it's not surprising. The receiver, it was, an, it was a great attempt, but it was just too noisy. The magnetic field limit they had was they could only detect something if it was 40 milligauss or stronger. Uh, microgauss, not milli. That's a factor of 1,000 there. Um, but they couldn't do it. So uh, in the acknowledgments, he thanks Professor Lovell for setting up this, this postdoc for him. Uh, not shortly after, or not too long after that, in 66, uh, Lovell came to Canada, visited Jack at ARO, and then went to Penticton and visited John here in this observatory. Um, ten years go by <clears throat> where Rod Davies, I talked to him, uh, essentially John left and left him high and dry. John had trained these two students to be Zeeman experts and magnetic field experts, but uh, he wasn't working directly with Slater and Shooter, but he inherited them. So Davies really got interested in this magnetic field thing after that, so much so that he ended up supervising four separate theses over a decade, all searching for Zeeman splitting in the 21 centimeter line, just like the long search that Ewan and Purcell were involved with. Nothing came of it. Uh, yeah, Jodro Bank, thousands of hours, no detections. Sandy Weinreb at the 85 foot, no detection. Caltech Group, Owens Valley, no detection. All this was happening. Nobody's finding it. 1968 comes around. July 4th, nine years and two weeks later after John's paper, it's discovered. There's the Orion arm absorption profile in 21 centimeters, very local to us. And here is the Perseus arm feature. Well, <clears throat> if you were going to look for Zeeman splitting for reasons at the time, you'd want a very narrow line. They thought, turns out later, that's not such a good reason. But they zoomed in on this line, all the people over the last 10 years. Everyone ignored this until Dave Heeshan. Dave Heeshan said, Ver Garrett Verskier, you welcome to the NRAO. <clears throat> you did your thesis work on Zeeman splitting. I'd like you to use the 140-foot telescope in Green Bank to look for it. And he said, no thanks. I just spent six years doing that, and I don't want to do it anymore. Well, Dave said, well, hold on now. We just built this new correlator, and it's got a lot of channels. And this would be an excellent opportunity to make this measurement, test it out. So I want you to go out and do it anyway. This isn't a question. It's a direct order. And he went out, and he did it. And he made that measurement, and thank goodness he did, because if he had just, you, every, like everyone else, they found there was no field here in the Orion arm. In the Perseus arm, there's a really strong field. Not strong enough that John would have discovered it in Jodrell Bank, but strong enough that, in fact, if Sandy Weinreb, oops, sorry, if Sandy Weinreb had moved his uh, correlator over to, well, oh, there it is, over to that uh, Perseus absorption feature. He would have easily discovered Zeeman splitting in 1962 in Greenbank. That calculation is very easy to make. Uh, you know, in spite of this, Sandy did all right with his career. So, uh, <clears throat> but um, meanwhile, back in Canada, 
what's going on with the DRAO. So <clears throat> it was agreed that we would build a telescope. Uh, NRC put in a proposal. Uh, D Dominion Observatory put in a proposal for a dish about the same size each. Uh, the NRC withdrew their proposal, and the, the DAO or DO, Dominion Observatory, uh, their proposal was approved, and it was going to be called the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. But they had to figure out where to put it. And simultaneously, the NRC was doing a search of the eastern part of the country. And Ed Argyle and Jack Locke got in a travel all and drove down. And I like the, the phrasing here. <clears throat> They wanted to go out and find something in British Columbia. They had looked at stereographic images of British Columbia. They knew that there was going to be nice valleys out here. They hop in their travel all and they go out to British Columbia by way of Green Bank, West Virginia, and Owens Valley, California. <laughs> not exactly what I had not really by way of, but they did because they, there were no observations yet at Green Bank. There were no telescopes, so they wanted to get a feel for what the RF environment was there. Same thing down at the Caltech site. So they did that, and I've been in touch with George Aitken all about those. Uh, he was a, an, an undergrad student uh, making measurements uh, on that trip for the NRC with Norm Broughton. The two groups came together uh, and looked at the sites in British Columbia. So we'll see a bit of that in just a second. Here is Jack Locke in his travel all down from Ottawa in Green Bank just outside the observatory. Here they are on observatory grounds. Uh, there's the barn in the backyard and the background. Here's some other uh, cows here. There's their travel all and their antenna, and they're making the measurements of radio frequency interference. Here they are. There's no uh, photos in this album of, uh, of the trip to Owens Valley, but they do end up here in White Lake. This is the field that you'll see behind you. Here is some coal slag or a heap that you'll see if you look past some of the garages over here. That was a functioning coal mine up through the 1930s, uh, so all through the 1800s. Here was the lone tree that uh, somebody here decided to cut down a few months ago. <laughs> but that was it. That tree is gone. Uh, and that is a World War II aerial that was the NRC truck out there. And there they are parked together, working to, you know, as a team. There's the DO, there's NRC making this measurement. One thing they hadn't anticipated, this was an old homestead, the remains of which are still out in the back out there, is that uh, cows like to scratch their backs on the guy lines of the antenna. So one morning they found the antenna in a heap here. Uh, back then, we mentioned before, DRAO was a member of Mines and Technical Surveys. So February 1959, they've selected a site. The antenna is purchased from Kennedy Corporation, the same antenna company that built the, the Harvard telescope. So it arrives in February. John comes back from Jodrell Bank just in time to oversee this. One thing that didn't occur to me, why did it, <clears throat> yeah, they came in February. Why did they move everything up here to the site in February? Well, it's because the roads <clears throat> are not hard enough because it was not paved to take these heavy bits up here, they had to do it while it was still frozen. So it sort of seems backwards, but that's the reason they did it in the winter. Here is John Locke, that's Jack's son. And thank you to John for all of these color photos. John brought them here a couple of years ago and left them in our library. Uh, they were all color slides Jack had taken throughout his career. So we had only seen this history in black and white until John brought these to us. It was really quite an amazing day. Here are all the pieces on the grounds ready to be assembled. And clearly, the snow's gone. And later that year, uh, they worked with the contractors to get the base built. Where did the concrete come from? Well, they didn't get that from downtown either. They built an aqueduct out of plywood up to a spring up in the hill. And they mixed all the concrete right here on site. Here's the old observatory building. There's the garage. There's the White Lake Inn. So they put the dish together on the grounds, got the panels all together. There's the Dominion Bridge Company. And then they lifted the, the uh, dish onto the telescope. And uh, these guys, breaking some safety rules, I'm sure, uh, weld the or put the uh, dish onto the structure. 
And that's John. I love this Norman Rockwell-esque photo of Jack and John looking at the nearly complete telescope there. Um, here's an article from the newspaper where they point out that, well, it's not that simple. OK, there's a telescope, but how do you get it aligned to the polar axis? Well, for that, you have to go out. And maybe you'll notice when we take our tour this afternoon, there's dozens of really big bolts and nuts on the base of the tower. They would twist each of those to move the whole entire structure until the telescope lined up with the North Celestial Pole. So this Kennedy telescope had a special feature introduced into it, an optical telescope that had its, its uh, column lined up with the radio telescope's column. Um, so that's, these are the nuts. You'll see them out there. If you look at the ones closest to the building, you'll notice an anomaly. The first six or so are cut right down to the nut. And that is because the workers weren't told to leave them alone. They wanted to tidy it up. So luckily, Jack, or probably John, saw this, ran out and told them, knock it off. And uh, they were able to make all the corrections they needed, even though that, uh, that little mistake was made. How did they actually do that? Well, John Galt, uh, they were getting worried. If anyone who spent a long time here knows that in the winter, we get socked in with three months, 12 weeks of clouds. The only way to do the alignment was optically, and they started in September. And they knew it was going to take a long time to align, so they were really racing the weather, but they lucked out. Essentially, when they were pointing at the pole, if all of their little stars had streaks or blobs, they weren't pointing at the pole truly. They had to keep adjusting the tower night after night with John making exposures. These are the original photographic plates until everything turned into little dots. And then in October, October 19th, they knew they were all lined up with the pole. And then they were ready to start doing some tests. So this is March 14th. There was an a, a, a eclipse in which John rode in the, the uh, tube and pointed at the moon. They apparently did some sort of measurement in which they were trying to figure out whether the moon was uh, surface was a layer of dust. So it was just a test to see if it was working. And here's a picture taken during that eclipse uh, before they even painted the telescope just to make sure things were working. That was the control room, the original control room. Some of you may notice it looks pretty similar to today. It's uh, <clears throat> everything right down to the, to the uh, lamp still there. Um, here is the Dominion astronomer coming to check up on how things are going. So this is uh, Roy Hamilton, John Galt, Ed Argyle, three of the originals. John still got his uh, Jodrell Bank <coughs> work, uh, work smock there. And then uh, this is uh, the Dominion astronomer Beals and his wife Miriam visiting the site. And this is before there was any telephone pole array. This is the 26 meter. That was the observatory, the original observatory. So the opening, Monday, 20 June, 1960, 4 PM. There was a, a two-day symposium where scientists came out and uh, gave talks all about the science they were hoping to do with this telescope. And we had some, uh, some honorary guests here. A lot of big wigs in the department or the, the government, they came out. Uh, you notice no, no maple leafs back then, right? Uh, so this was the opening day. Uh, this is a photo that's going to have a lot of names that we're going to hear over the next two days. We've already heard some of them. There's Dr. Hartz there. Uh, so here's Art Covington. Uh, well, the whole list goes on and on. All right? the, we'll see a lot of these names over the next couple of days. Right in the middle was the special guest of honor. This is Martin Schmidt. He, at the time, hadn't discovered what we now know are quasars, but he would. And he'd end up on the cover of Time magazine as a distinguished guest. Um, so uh, let's see. So during the opening address, Jack Locke uh, talked to the public. One of the interesting things to me is if you zoom in here, one of the last things he mentions is what John just did at Jodrell Bank, that it, it's thought now that we can measure magnetic fields far, far away. And this telescope is going to be part of that. Well, it makes sense. I mean, John just pioneered this the search for Zeeman splitting, why wouldn't, and this, this telescope was built for 21 centimeter studies, wouldn't it make sense he'd do that? So that's one of the questions that, as a, you know, as a budding historian, I, I really regret I'll never be able to ask John. I've asked everyone who's worked with John, nobody really knows why he never got around to doing that. 
1961 photo of Jacks visiting Hat Creek. This telescope is also an 85-foot telescope, or was. It fell over in a massive windstorm. But for a good decade, it became the world's leading 21-centimeter Zeeman machine. And it was able to measure all kinds of magnetic fields. Why didn't Galt ever use his 26 meter out back? And uh, the best we can figure, especially now that I've read a lot of interviews with John and Jack Locke, is that he was just too busy. He came here. He was immediately thrown into being the director. Uh, there was a large single channel 21 centimeter survey going on for many years with the 26 meter. And then after that, he was put uh, in charge of the uh, 10 megahertz array pro or 10 megahertz telescope project out here. I think he was just always too busy to do that. Uh, here's a visit in January 1965. This is John Bolton. This is Carmen Costain, one of the original staff members. And this is John Galt. And there you go, all in one photo right out here, <clears throat> a couple of uh, maybe 100 yards away, the guy who said there should be 21 centimeters Amon splitting, the guy who first went and looked for it. Um, Carmen Costain came here from Cambridge. He was a graduate student there working in Martin Ryle's group. So this is Sir Martin Ryle, who won the Nobel Prize in 1974, uh, visiting the observatory here. Um, lots and lots of photos in uh, Jack Locke's uh, album of Martin's visit. Uh, they'll be playing outside during the break, so maybe you'll see some. Uh, and shortly after that, we had a new staff member, and that's Rob Roger. Uh, Jack Locke says in an interview he had no idea that Rob Rogers' parents were in Penticton when he was hired from Jodrell Bank. So how about that for local boy ma makes good. He comes back from, uh, from the UK and uh, starts a position here at DRAO, having grown up right down the road. And stay tuned, up next Rob's going to tell us everything that we all don't know and wish we did about those the big telephone pole array outside and the one that's no longer there, the 10 megahertz. Uh, thank you. So um, here's 1981. <clears throat> John Galt, uh, he retires as director. This is probably one of his happiest days. He can now get back to doing research. Uh, Lloyd takes on the burden. And, uh, and we have a new, uh, both of these guys, Lloyd and Chris Burton, return uh, to Penticton. They had spent time here before and join the staff here. Um, <clears throat> I really like this story. If you look at the history, it's a two-volume history of the Dominion Observatory, the heavens above and the earth beneath. Um, the author uh, asked each of the division heads and directors to send them a photo of themselves at work. And so everybody had their standard headshots with their suit and tie that they sent. Uh, <clears throat> they sent a letter to John like that, and he says, a close-up of the paraboloid. I asked Dr. Galt to give me a photograph showing him at work. This was his contribution. And so <clears throat> there's, there's John up there at the top. So that's in the history books. Um, so John's legacy is continuing here at the DRAO. We're planning to map the 21 centimeter line, the Zeeman effect splitting in the 21 centimeter line throughout the Milky Way using the 26 meter. Right? The reason why I'm here is exactly for that. Uh, there's no other telescope in the world you can do it. The biggest telescopes, all of them have very complicated responses that you'll never be able to characterize. You'll never get the time, and you'll never get the copious amount of observing time you need to make the measurements in the first place, never mind the characterization of the polarization. Here we have a telescope that has done decades worth of polarization measurements, and we have bright graduate students. We just published a paper the other day in PSP that can work out, help us work out the polarization response of that dish. And we have all the time we need to map out the uh, magnetic field in the Milky Way. And the good news is 21 centimeters emission is everywhere. It's everywhere. So there's, we're not limited to where we can point and make measurements of the magnetic field. So to that end, uh, well, take a step back. Two years ago, we had a workshop uh, celebrating John's career. And uh, we had a two-day workshop, very similar to the opening of the DRAO and similar to, to this one here. And uh, we had people come and tell us about the latest science, that uh, the latest in the scientific fields that John had studied over his career. 
And we dedicated the telescope in John's name. There's a plaque out there, English and French. You can go and read it and read about John's contributions. Um, and we've just, last week, received a brand new Meerkat receiver. This is a square kilometer array prototype or a Pathfinder telescope. This is, this is fitted with uh, LNAs that were built at DAO, just across the Georgia Strait. And these are world record level sensitivity LNAs. So we're going to put that on the John Galt telescope and really start measuring magnetic fields. Um, so one last thing looking back through the records, I noticed that there was a familiar face in all of the press clippings throughout time from the very beginning. And that was the celestial globe. So everywhere, every time a staff photographer was sent to cover the observatory, they all made the astronomer stand and look ponderously at the, the celestial globe. It's still there. Same one. Uh, same one. All there. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I got a lot of help for, for this talk, and I just wanted to leave the names of the people that were so helpful in coming up with this story. So thank you. <laughs> So, questions? Yes? Uh, Tim, just a comment. Yep. Um, two comments. First one is that picture that you saw that globe. Oh, yeah. It looks like one of the Johnson globes that we didn't know you were. I don't know. Could be. You know what Congress was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were probably telling a joke so I could look. Uh, uh, I didn't want to break the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, from Kennedy. from Kennedy. Yeah. Okay. Yep. They did Oh, did they? They did and they put it in Yeah. Um, it. Huh. I don't think that we, that we do. I'll have to. And so there's one of these that has the text of, yo, know, somewhere in Penticton right now. There's, great. OK, well, we'll have to look that up. That'd be great. Yes, Phil. Yes. Yes. Yes, I have. I have. Uh, I have a, another pristine copy without the names in the archive, and I'll scan that in at high resolution and put it on the workshop page so that people can. Yeah, and we'll we'll include the lower res one with the names as well. Yes. Yep. Uh, maybe somebody from DRAO can correct me on this, but you commented that John Galt never got around to doing his on on this 26 meter. Yes. However, I think early 70s, late 60s, Bill Shooter did. I, in the interviews I've read that Woody has done and Richard has done, people had been asked that. Bill Shooter, people remember discussions of Bill Shooter arriving here and discussing it with John, but nobody could remember any measurements being done. So uh, that's, that's all I know about that. Um, so it was, it was a thought. But again, I'm just going to chalk it up to everything I learned points to John being just too darn busy to get around to it. So. Yes? Well, it's, uh, I didn't prepare any science slides for this. Uh, after almost a decade of observing, there were about 500 points that were measured. And if you look at a sky distribution of the points that were measured, it's a tiny fraction of the sky. So there's no, there's a, <clears throat> we'll run out of telescope before we run out of places to, to point it. So, <clears throat> uh, yes? Just a minor comment. My, my guess would be that's in physics today. OK. In, in the 60s, it was a very common thing for military uh, uh, companies to advertise you know, something that was sciencey. OK. 
Yeah, we've got a copy of the whichever the magazine is up in the archives, so we can check. Yeah, yeah. And there was there was uh, I think it's the whole magazine, and this shows up in a copy of uh, when Ewan finished his time at NRAO, he opened up a receiver company called Knight, Ewan Knight, I believe. Ewan Knight, Ewan, Ewan Knight. And uh, we purchased, our first 21 centimeter receiver was purchased from their corporation. And he put out a giant book that was sort of a, a magazine type book that uh, was everything we knew about radio. So we have a copy of that up in the, in the archive. Yes. So it's sort of, it was sort of like a Sears catalog for radio astronomy. So, uh, we might just mention, a lot of people won't know that Doc Ewan immediately wanted to get out of Harvard to found a company. He was an entrepreneur type, uh, which soon became Ewan Knight Corporation, which was incredibly successful. And he became a very rich man in oh. the succeeding decades. I did not know. All right. Very good. Um, so it's in this book, right? <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah. Really slowed down things at Harvard because now yes. we had for sale that one do his business and no one to follow up. This is not the astronomy department. Mm -hmm. It's only when Mark Bach arrived about a year later that he said, "Got to do something about this." And then he found out that uh, Ewan was still in the area, and, and so Ewan supplied the receivers and Bach supplied the students. All right. And it wasn't always that successful because you didn't really have anyone that knew how to use the receivers. Right. Uh, well. well. I was listening to uh, an interview that was done with Kochi recently, and, and you sort of uh, <clears throat> you rem reminisce about how d tough it was when uh, you and left because uh, suddenly you had to learn how to do all of the electronics, and right? You, <laughs> you like to build the system, right? It's not so much money involved in building receivers or radio astronomy installation. So I need that. Yeah, well, sure even nominally, we were still the co-directors of the project. He never appeared. Oh, he was <laughs> nominally a co-director. I was the co-director of the project. And who was the other director? You. I didn't realize he was a co-director of the yeah. project. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, yes, Bob. Um, so during the site survey, yeah. for the two vehicles, yes. I assume the uh, Dominion vehicle had all of the, the electronic equipment set up. No, they both had an antenna and they both had the electronics. In fact, uh, because <clears throat> the uh, the travel all knew it was coming here. They knew this was going to be the best spot. Turns out there was a place in Kootenai Crossing out in the Kootenays that was uh, maybe a little bit better, but it was didn't satisfy the other five criteria. They wanted to be near it. Uh, the, the, the travel all the travel all went by itself to Green Bank, so that big antenna fit in the car when they were uh, when they were there. But the uh, after Penticton, the travel all went back to Ottawa, and the NRC World War II van uh, did the rest of BC and then Lake Traverse, and, and the rest the, the rest of that fall they did Ottawa and the eastern uh, shore. So yeah. What's that? The there are people who are capable of attracting the Yes, team. yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. All right, great. Well, we should move on to the next talk. So there you go. All right. <laughs>